Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Derek Uzkal, Senior Program Officer focusing on the future of work and equitable opportunities here at the Kauffman Foundation. Put on your entrepreneurship research goggles because today we're taking a data dive into some indicators of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship covers a wide range of economic activities, from self-employment to new employer businesses to venture-backed high-growth firms. Looking at one metric will only tell part of the story. Today's forum will cover several related entrepreneurship indicators, including the Kauffman Indicators of Early Stage Entrepreneurship, or KEIS. This is a set of measures that represents new business creation in the United States. The Kauffman New Employer Business Indicators, or NEB. This series provides information about a particular type of entrepreneurship, new businesses that hire employees. These indicators allow us to track changes surrounding entrepreneurial trends over time. This is particularly valuable as we are able to compare what is happening during COVID-19 with what we saw during the Great Recession, for example. While no single indicator can provide a complete picture of all types of entrepreneurial activity at any given time, taken together, the Kauffman indicators provide a sense of the state of entrepreneurship across the United States. In this forum, our guest speakers will explore these indicators of entrepreneurship in more detail. After the speaker presentations, I will moderate a question and answer period. I encourage you to use the chat feature to send your questions in for the panelists. I'll do my best to get to as many questions or themes from the chat as possible. We host this forum to provide a platform for an in-depth discussion on how to solve problems. And the Kauffman Foundation does not take a political position or legislative position on these discussions. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Robert Fairley, professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Rob, when you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's been kind of an incredible, um, at least couple decades working with the Kauffman Foundation on kind of the early stages of trying to come up with measures of entrepreneurship in the US economy. And also, you know, a few different aspects of it, trying to get this idea that Derek mentioned about capturing all entrepreneurs, all types of new businesses, all types of people that are creating these businesses. And that was kind of the original uh, origination of this type of project. So I'm gonna talk about some of the highlights from uh, 2021, which is the newest year that we have available for the data set. And I will proceed with the... Uh, so the early stage entrepreneurship series is one that tries to capture new business creation in the US using several high quality and timely sources of information on early stage entrepreneurship. Sounds like it would be easy to find these data sources, but it actually isn't. And it's taken us some time to be able to create this series. But the series consists of four indicators of entrepreneurship. There's the rate of new entrepreneurs, which I'll talk about in a second, the opportunity share of new entrepreneurs, startup early job creation and startup early survival rate. Then what we do is we take these four measures, we combine them and we create a summary index that's an equally weighted measure of the four. The rate of new entrepreneurs is kind of the original index that was created many years ago. What it does is it captures the percentage of the adult non-business owner population that creates a business each month. So it's trying to capture all types of businesses. They could be employer, non-employer, they could be necessity type businesses, they could be opportunity businesses. They could be incorporated, unincorporated, all kinds that are out there in the country. It's calculated using the CPS, which is a Bureau of Labor Statistics product. So the rate of new entrepreneurs typically is around 0.3%. So this is creation per month. So that's why it seems like a relatively low number. But if, if you kind of like think of that in annual terms, it's a it's much larger number. And you can see the patterns over time. So the series goes back to 1996 and through 2021. You can see that this rate of entrepreneurship has been relatively steady going up and down over time. And if we put a few markers on here, you can see that it actually went up slightly in the Great Recession. Then you can see what happened in 2020 with COVID. You can see this increase. Now, why would it actually increase? Well, part of it is that this is capturing all types of business creation. It's capturing those from individuals who might have become unemployed and had no other alternative and had to start up a business out of necessity. So this next measure is the opportunity share of new entrepreneurs. And this gets at this kind of economic condition part of it much, um, much more precisely. 
So it captures the percentage of new entrepreneurs who created a business out of choice. So it's a simple percentage of the total new businesses created. It captures what percent were created out of opportunity instead of out of necessity. And so what it does is it captures these kind of broad insights about economic conditions. It is also calculated using the same CPS data set. So now you can see a clear trend here. The Great Recession, there was a large drop in the opportunity share, dropped by a little over five percentage points. But you can see that 2020 was unlike any other period of time. That's where we saw this massive drop. It dropped over 15 percentage points in that one year. But you can see also what's kind of nice to see is that in 2021, we see this kind of rebound. And it'll be interesting to see in 2022 if this continues. But clearly COVID-19 created a situation that was unlike anything we've ever seen before, including the Great Recession. Startup early job creation is the next indicator. This captures early employment of a cohort of startup businesses in their first year. So it's trying to capture that kind of first year of job creation. The other two measures that I mentioned before were all about the owner, about the new business. Well, now we're gonna switch and think about, well, how many jobs are created by these new startups? We have to go to a different data set. It's the Business Employment Dynamics data set, which is a database of the US, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what we do is we look at how many new employees there are per 1,000, or sorry, how many new yeah, employees are there per 1,000 people. So now you can see there's also kind of this cyclical component, but it's not as strong. So startup early job creation was a lot higher also in the 90s and early 2000s. And then it had this kind of decline over time. The Great Recession accelerated that decline. So we saw a big drop to the point where we have four jobs per 1,000 people. And then it was steady. It was growing a bit over time. And then you can see in 2020, that started another decline, although not as strong as the Great Recession. And then 2021, that continued. Another thing we wanted to look at is all of the metrics have, have looked at kind of new jobs, new creation, and whether or not it's opportunity or necessity. What about survival? So it's hard to measure survival in, in kind of a fast um, early stage. And so what we thought we would do is look at a one-year survival rate instead of focusing on maybe a five-year survival rate. Because then what we could do is we could say, well, early in COVID or early in the Great Recession, let's measure what happens to those businesses one year later. If we have to wait five years, then we can't say anything about the impacts of COVID until five years after it happens. So the idea is something that we can measure quickly and update fast. So this is simply a measure of the number of startups that survive one year later in the data. It also comes from the Business Employment Dynamics data set from the BLX. Now here you can also see this kind of strong cyclical pattern. The Great Recession, uh, we saw this kind of drop in survival rates. In 2020, we also saw a survival rate drop. And what's interesting is in 2021, we see this kind of increase in survival rates above what we've seen in the past. Now, what could be happening here is this is conditional on a business starting up. And it could be that only those that are kind of stronger types of businesses are going to take the risks at this point in time. It also could be that there were a number of holes that were created from COVID-19 in terms of business opportunities and businesses are coming in to fill those gaps. Now, we also create a summary index, the KISA index. It's an equally weighted average of the four indicators. The base level is from the earliest two decades of data that we have, 1996 to 2015. So it's all relative to the average over that period of time. And so an index is sometimes hard to kind of think about, but basically what it's doing is it's, it's moving around over time, all relative to the, that first two decade measure. And, and typically it's, you know, it's capturing these four different measures. So it doesn't always move exactly with the business cycle, but you can see that it, it does capture the Great Recession and the COVID recession of 2020 pretty well. You see a big drop in the Great Recession. Um, the index dropped by two points over that time. And then in COVID, we saw a little over a one point drop. And then this incredible rebound that we're seeing in 2021. 
The other thing that we can do in Kiza is we can look at demographics. I'm not going to have time to present too many results here, but I want to show you some of the interesting information that's here. We can look at this by gender, race and ethnicity, nativity, age, education level, and veteran status. So I'm going to focus on gender first. This shows you the rate of new entrepreneurs by for men and for women. You can see that over this kind of period of time, entrepreneurship is higher among men than women, and that's been pretty steady. There are some differences in COVID. You can see this kind of increase that I showed you before for the total. It happened for both men and women, and then the drop that happened in 2021. Again, this is capturing all types of business creation. So these could be a lot of individuals who were laid off from their jobs and then go out and start businesses out of necessity, not out of a choice. You can also look at rate of new entrepreneurs by race and ethnicity. So you can see the patterns here by different groups. So the, the group with the highest rate of, of kind of new business creation per month is Latinx population. You can see that it's higher than for other groups. Um, the group that has relatively lowest business creation rates over time is, is for Blacks or African Americans. You can see that that's changing, or at least we don't know with the disruptions of COVID, there could be some changes into that, those patterns. And you can see that Asian and white American rates are relatively similar. Now, what, what this doesn't capture when I show you just the rates of, of new entrepreneurs is what's happened to the shares over time. And there we see a big change. So what has happened is the percent of new entrepreneurs that are white has declined over time. And that's kind of the blue bottom area, whereas other groups have mostly increased. So if I kind of zero in on the change from 1996 to 2021, these changes are, are, are quite extensive. So the percentage of new entrepreneurs back in 1996 that were white was 77%, and now it's only 54.5%. The black rate has gone up from 8.4 to 10%, but you can see the real change has been for the Latinx population. Latinx were uh, capturing 10% of new entrepreneurs back in 1996, and that has almost increased to a quarter of all new entrepreneurs this year. And you can see that Asian Americans have also seen this massive increase from 3.4% to 7.3%. We also produce results for the rate of new entrepreneurs by state, which isn't really interesting. And I certainly do not have time to go into all the details here, because as you can imagine, there are some really interesting differences across states. You can see some of the states that have the highest rates of entrepreneurship are the ones that are in the darker colors. So good examples of this are California and Florida traditionally have high rates of entrepreneurship. And the lower rates um, often are kind of in the Rust Belt states. Uh, Pennsylvania is a good example. Um, and so it just shows you, you know, that there are these big differences across states. So if you're interested in more information, we have the visual, visualizations as I just showed you for the states. Um, at this web page, we have reports that you can also download if you want to look into more details and get a little more on the methodology that you use to create these measures and the underlying data sets. We also have data tables that you can download and you can look at them and do your own analysis at kind of more of an aggregate level. And if you're a real data nerd like I am, <laughs> you can go and download the actual data sets that I use to create a number of these measures. And there you have actual micro data with you know, literally millions of observations and you can you know, use statistical packages to analyze them. So let me my, stop my share here and I am Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder to everyone joining us today, please uh, continue to use the chat. Uh, a lot of library conversation there with any questions you have or comments or resources that you think may be helpful for those attending today. Our final speaker today is Dr. Jessica Luz, Director of Knowledge Creation and Research here at the Kauffman Foundation. Jessica, once you're ready, please feel free to take it away. Excellent. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. It is so good to be here today alongside Rob and Derek and with each of you tuning in to join this conversation about the Kaufman Indicators. The Kaufman Indicators help us to measure the state and change of entrepreneurship throughout the United States. And as Rob just shared a bit about the Kaufman Indicators of Early Stage Entrepreneurship, or KEIS as we like to call it, uh, which is a set of measures that allows us to examine new business creation. And today I'm going to be sharing highlights from the Kaufman New Employer Business Indicators. 
uh, or NEB as we like to call it. And these provide information on new businesses that hire employees. These indicators track trends going back over the past decade and a half allowing us to see changes that have taken place since just before the Great Recession. Next slide. So to, so to start off, it might be helpful to share what I mean by a new employer business. Well, for these indicators, we define new employer businesses as a business startup that hires an employee within the first two years after filing a business application. Why two years, you might wonder? Well, we know from research that Rob and others have done that most businesses that end up hiring employees do so within the first few years. Next slide. The Kaufman New Employer Business Indicators are constructed using publicly available data from three data sources. The Business Formation Statistics, or BFS, is a data set provided by the US Census Bureau that is based on IRS data of employer identification numbers or EINs. EIN applications are known to provide forward-looking and timely information on business formations. And there's a paper by Kimberly Bayard and colleagues that discusses this data set in detail that I would encourage you to check out if you haven't already. The Business Dynamics uh, Statistics, or the BDS, is also a product of the US Census Bureau that measures net change in employment at the establishment level. And the Population Estimates Program, or PEP data, allows us to examine how trends in new employer businesses may be changing in relation to population changes. For more details on how the Kaufman New Employer Business Indicators were constructed, I would encourage you to check out the methods paper written by my colleagues, Travis Howe and Sammy Desai, who developed these indicators while they were at the Kaufman Foundation. And we'll drop a link to that paper in the chat. Next slide, please. The Kaufman New Employer Business Indicators include four indicators and a summary index. Uh, for today, I'm gonna to focus on the national level trends that we're seeing around these four indicators. These are the rate of new employer business actualization, new employer business velocity, the rate of new employer businesses, and employer business newness. Next slide. Before we dive into the indicators, I'd like to provide a bit of context in terms of what we've been seeing from the BFS data around business applications broadly. Business applications have been largely on the rise over the past 15 years, which is as far back as we have data from the BFS. And throughout the pandemic, we've seen some pretty remarkable swings with a large decline in business applications during the early months of the pandemic followed by a spike in July of 2020. This figure here is from a working paper by two of my colleagues, Katie Anderson and Hayden Murray, who took a look at some of these trends. This paper will be available soon on the Kaufman Foundation website, uh, and we'll share it with everyone once it's available. Next slide. This figure shows how the number of business applications denoted here by BA, as well as business applications with planned wages, uh, shown there as WBA, have changed since 2005. We can see that while business applications have grown notably in the last five years, especially between 2019 and 2020, business applications with planned wages or those businesses that uh, indicated a date at which they intended to start paying wages plummeted during the Great Recession and have not recovered. Next slide. So all of that provides some context for the first of these indicators, the rate of new employer business actualization. And this is the share of business applications that become employers within two years of filing an application. Next slide. You can see that this has been trending downward since at least 2005, where our data begins, with a slight increase from 2020 to 2021. In 2021, the national rate of new employer business actualization was 9.16% compared with 19.15 back in 2005. This means that in 2005, close to one in five new business applications became a new employer. Today, this is closer to one in 10. 
A methodological note here that I should point out is that rather than using variables in the BFS data set that indicate business applications that are likely to have employees, such as was shown in the previous figure with business applications with planned wages, with this indicator, we focus on those businesses that do in fact hire their first employee within two years of filing their business application for the years that are available. Projected data is used for 2020 and 2021. Next slide. The second indicator in the NEB series is new employer business velocity or the average amount of time in quarters that passes between filing a business application and hiring a first employee or making a first payroll among those businesses that become employers within the first two years. Next slide. Among those new businesses that become employers, time to hire a first employee has been increasing. New employer business velocity was approximately 4.5 months in 2005, compared to a little over six months by 2017. I should note here that the 2017 value is for those businesses that started in 2017 and hired a first employee by 2019. There's a notable data lag with this indicator, and we are not yet able to see how this indicator may have changed during COVID-19. Taken together, these first two indicators, actualization and velocity, suggest that over the past decade and a half, a smaller share of new business applications have been turning into new employers. And among those that do, it is taking longer to do so. There are a number of possible reasons for these trends. We discussed some of these in a brief that we released a couple of years ago, which we'll share the link to in the chat. Some possible reasons include the emergence of new technologies and tools, the rising cost of employee benefits, such as healthcare, and the rise of alternative work arrangements, such as gig work. Next slide. The third indicator is the rate of new employer businesses, or the number of startups that become new employers for every 100 people. This helps us to have a better sense of what the new employer business trends look like adjusted for population. This is particularly relevant when we are examining differences among states. And similar to what Rob shared with the KEYS data, we also have uh, data available to download by state. So I'm just focused on the national level trends today. So here we see some upward trends in recent years. Beginning in 2016, we've seen an increase in the number of new employer businesses per 100 people. The pandemic appears to have accelerated this rise. The rate of new employer businesses rose from 0.12 in 2020 to 0.15 in 2021, meaning that in 2021, there were roughly 150 new employer businesses for every 100,000 people. I should note that this increase coincides with what Rob shared with the early stage entrepreneurship indicators as startup early survival rates, the percent of startups active after one year, also increased between 2020 and 2021. Next slide. The fourth and final indicator that I will share today is employer business newness or new employer businesses as a share of all employer firms. This indicator is constructed using the BDS data, which allows us to track the number of employer firms across the US and in each state. Next slide. We've seen a recent increase in the share of employer firms in the US that is made up of new employer businesses. The share has been increasing since 2017, though it is still lower than it was in 2006. In 2019, around 7% of all firms were new employer businesses, compared to just over 9% in 2006. It's important to note that this indicator only runs through 2019 as there's a lag in BDS data available. So we aren't yet able to see COVID related trends here. However, a piece released last month by Ryan Decker and John Haltwanger examined firm size distribution using more recent data from the business employment dynamics data set and found an increased share of firms and employment are accounted for by smaller firms, many of which are also newer firms. They attribute this to both an increase in new firms as well as existing firms downsizing into smaller size categories as a result of the pandemic recession. 
There is suggestive evidence then that alongside the increase in business applications during the pandemic, that we are seeing new and small firms playing a larger role in the economy. It remains to be seen, of course, what will become of these businesses and what this means for the broader economy as we continue emer to emerge from the pandemic and as more data becomes available in the coming months and years. So what does all of this mean? Well, historically, entrepreneurship has been linked to job creation as young firms, particularly high growth firms, which is a small subset of startups that end up hiring a lot of people, have been responsible for a lot of job creation. The decline we're seeing in business actualization is uh, potentially worrisome in terms of job creation because if fewer business applications end up hiring employees, this means fewer jobs are being created by these new businesses. And the link between entrepreneurship and new job creation is less clear. We saw a similar trend in the slides that Rob showed with a long-term trend of declining numbers of jobs created by startups in their first year. There's also an open question about job quality. What kind of jobs are these businesses creating? Are these good jobs that are allowing individuals to provide and care for themselves and their families? At the Kauffman Foundation, as part of our inclusive prosperity framework, we're focusing on job quality and what this entails and what it will take to ensure that individuals have access to good jobs. These indicators also raise questions about what all of this means for individuals, for families, and for communities. Will the rise in business applications yield businesses that individuals are able to sustain and grow? Despite the increase in the startup survival rate this past year that Rob shared earlier, that indicator still suggests that nearly one in five business startups fail within their first year. And this can have serious consequences for those individuals and families who are trying to get a business off the ground and are not successful. And finally, the new employer business indicators shared today do not allow us to see who is filing these business applications and how this might vary by race, by ethnicity, by gender. Understanding how these trends surrounding new employer businesses might vary by demographics is important to understanding where the most promising opportunities are for supporting greater inclusive prosperity. To download the data shared here today, as well as reports and papers detailing the methods used to construct the indicators, I would encourage you to check out the website. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Derek. Thank you, Jessica. And as a reminder to the audience, please continue to use the chat feature. We've had a lot of great questions come in with the time we have remaining. I'll do my best to get to as many of those questions and themes of those questions as possible. So uh, to begin, uh, perhaps let's start with some of the early questions that came in. Uh, Rob, there were some questions about uh, for during your presentation about how granular the data set go. And you, you certainly showed, uh, you know, highlighted some of the state level, but there are questions about regional, county, municipal levels, uh, depending on which specific part of the indicator. I, I know that there can be various levels. So uh, what, what's a good way to, for our audience to think about how granular the data can be accessed. Yeah, so I think the key is to think of it as two different data sets. There's the, the first two measures are based on the current population survey, and that's actually a survey that's done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that's then created into microdata. There, the limitation is that you really can't go below the state level, but we do provide that on a web page where you can download the data set and look at this individual by individual. The geographical part of it is not you know, it doesn't have extreme details and measures, but there's a lot of other information in there. You know, for example, you could cut it by age and by race and gender and some of those aspects if you wanted to download the data and do that. The other half of it, the other half of the indicators is from the um, BLS's data set that's based on min administrative data. And I think that there are some metropolitan measure measures in there. I'm not sure how many there are it might just be kind of like the broad you know business creation like the total employment numbers or the total numbers of businesses so it might not have all of the detail certainly at the state level there's a lot of detail thank you rob and, and uh, a little bit related too into how granular uh, we can get it with some of these intersections there was a question related to uh, looking at race and ethnicity, but also then by necessity and opportunity by race and ethnicity. 
and, and, and do we see changing patterns there or are we able to get that granular as well? Yes, yeah, so there is some information. What you typically see is that, you know, for groups that are more disadvantaged, you see more necessity entrepreneurship than opportunity entrepreneurship. That of course has also changed a lot, it changes a lot with the business cycle. The patterns tend to go in the same direction for each racial group over the business cycle. So there is some more information reported in the report if, you're, if you want to look at that. Okay, let's go a little broader now. And I think one of the common themes that, that came up, and, and Jessica, you really highlighted this towards the, towards the end, thinking about kind of looking forward. It's hard not to think about the pandemic's effect uh, on all of these indicators. And so, you know, I, I guess maybe a common theme here is, Again, the future is unknown and unknowable, I guess, in many ways, but uh, what types of things should we look for in the data that will tell us what's structurally different and, and what is uh, temporary? Yeah, I think um, I'll jump in and then Rob, feel free to also weigh in on this. I think, you know, one of the things that is always a bit frustrating, particularly using sort of these large data sets that, that come, um, is there's, there's a lag time, right? To collect the data, to clean the data, to ensure that we're really looking at, at what we, um, at looking at accurate numbers. And so I think we're all just sort of in this uh, period of waiting, you know, seeing what we're seeing now, but a lot of even the most recent stuff is still 2021, which we're now six months into 2022. And so, but I do think there are, particularly with the new employer business indicators, I think there are some longer term trends that, that we're seeing continuing, um, particularly around you know, the decline in actualization, the lengthening time that it's taking to hire and, uh, employees. It will be interesting to see whether or not you know, COVID, sort of the shifts that we're seeing in COVID are extending more long-term or if they are just sort of a, a blip and then we're returning to some of these longer term trends. Yeah, to kind of follow up on that, I think that there are a couple of kind of key trends that are that are changing and then ones that are staying the same. One is we've seen this kind of increase in self-employment activity, you know, people driving Ubers, doing more kind of contracting work. That has gone up. I think that that's been accelerated somewhat with COVID, and I don't think it's going to return to where we would have expected it to be other, you know, without COVID happening. And then the other is, I think that what we've seen is kind of a shift to kind of more online purchasing. Consumers have become more comfortable, you know, purchasing things online. And I think that that could be damaging for a lot of small business retailers and others that sell goods. Services, I think, is much more protected, right? Because you still need to go to these small businesses for, for restaurants, for um, haircuts, things like that. That, I think, is going to do well. Um, there might be more businesses that are created out of that that will be kind of a hybrid where there's a lot of catering or a lot of hybrid, you know, kind of online work that's created from it. But then also there's a brick and mortar store, you know, maybe a restaurant where people can go to it. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of innovative goods and services and businesses come out of this. I do think that there are a lot of gaps, a lot of holes that you see in small business areas, like in downtown areas that will be filled over time. It's just, we don't know like how that's going to change, you know, the structure of it's going to change. But I do think that it's going to be hard for retail. Thank you both. Uh, this uh, kind of ties in a little bit with a, another question that just came in through the chat, thinking about the industry, you know, how, how are these differences across in, industry? And, and Rob, you highlighted a couple examples there as well, too. And uh, to the degree that these indicators can tell us about industry, you know, please speak to that, but also what other uh, resources or where would you look to kind of complement this with some uh, industry focus as well, too? Yeah, to just kind of follow up on, you know, some of the points that I, I made earlier about retail. So the, the, the areas that will hit the hardest were certainly, you know, hospitality, hotels, um, big venues, art those kinds of areas that sort of like leisure and hospitality as a general one was hit extremely hard. Certainly hotels saw this just massive loss early in the pandemic and they have yet to recover from that. Other areas like agriculture, um, you know, obviously grocery stores, things like that were necessity businesses. And so they were kept open over this period of time. 
and have done okay. And so we're going to see this real shift and we're not sure where it's all going to clear out. But there is more information in the microdata that I posted for the, you know, two of the measures from the current population survey. So there's industry information to be able to look at that in more detail. And then also the data set that's provided from the BLS on the employer businesses, that also has more information on industry. So you can go to those web pages that are linked in the reports and also on my presentation and find out more information and look at this more carefully. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, that um, in the new employer business indicators that we have released so far, we have not examined industry, but we have done some, uh, some preliminary analysis looking at the indicators by industry. Um, one of the one of the things that's coming up is when we think about new employer business actualization. So those business applications that end up hiring uh, employees within the first couple of years. Uh, the highest industries in 2021 included accommodation and food services, followed by healthcare, social assistance, um, and these have also tended to be higher over time in terms of those industries where we're finding businesses are hiring employees. Uh, manufacturing and construction were also relatively high in 2021. Um, so we'll be continuing to dig into some of these industry trends, um, both over the long term and then, um, you know, future looking at COVID and kind of how that might be shifting as well, um, thinking about some of these trends that, that Rob has raised. So uh, obviously, you know, that, that's one lens that we can use to look at this, thinking about the different industry. Another one uh, also coming in through the chat is thinking about location and, and the differences uh, are there differences in trends with either Keith or Neb that are unique to the question says rural regions, but also how different are the stories for big cities in general versus smaller metros or certain states? Uh, Rob, I know you alluded to like uh, with the graphic, you know, more about the different state level data that's available. Um, but I kind of tease some of the like differences, I guess, that uh, people should look for when they when they want to dive a little deeper on on maybe what to look for and and what are some of those differences might be. Yeah, the information is there. We have all of these measures by state, and I think that people are starting to analyze the data carefully now. I've been doing a little bit of research trying to get a sense of whether or not the number of COVID cases per capita, for example, has impacted state level business ownership or business um, startup rates and haven't really found this a real strong pattern there. But I think that, you know, we, we do need a lot more research on this. I think it's going to be really interesting to look at the policies. So, for example, what did mask mandates, how did they impact um, business creation and business formation and the number of employees and business success? And then also other policies like the early shutdowns of non-essential businesses were important The kind of re- um, revisiting shutdowns in November and December of 2020, I think, is also another really interesting area that we need more research on. Certainly, COVID cases is an important one because of health concerns. So th there's a lot of research that I think can be done in this area, and we're really just at the starting point of it. Yeah, I would um, add to that a little bit that on the on the indicators website, we have you know places that you can dig into each state and see what uh, the case indicators look like for that state, what the NEB indicators look like for that state. Uh, we actually just a couple of weeks ago released uh, some updated one sheeters on uh, states in the Heartland area. So uh, the Kauffman Foundation focuses a lot on uh, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. So the case indicators that Rob presented today for each of those states, um, you can find and download on our website, um, just a nice overview of what those trends look like for those states. Um, and I would add to that too, you know, in addition to states, one of the things that we're thinking about for future indicator series is, is really getting more granular. Like you were saying, Derek, you know, looking at what do, what do trends look like in rural areas compared to suburban areas compared to urban areas? What does it look like within those, you know, those larger MSAs? Um, what does it look like at the county level and, and getting um, really into kind of more location specific, what those trends are that we're seeing. So, uh, thank you both so much. Uh, questions are continuing to come in, and uh, so just another coming in. Uh, great conversation so far, and there uh, I think are some emerging questions here as well, kind of related to uh, 
uh, a desire to get some more just kind of uh, gut reactions on like what some differences look like between like rural areas and metro areas and then as well like certain states that um, are you know are scoring higher in terms of like new entrepreneurs but uh, had higher COVID cases but fewer restrictions like things to connect there I, I know you, you both kind of teased that those are kind of inflection points to look at that still need a lot more research uh, so maybe to speak generally about uh, what things you would look for in data to, to help kind of answer these, you know, uh, questions that are clearly top of mind for a lot of people. Certainly the data sets are there. They're posted on the web page. You can download them and look at these questions more carefully. The question about rural areas, I think, is a really interesting one. What I've seen in the research in, is that rural areas actually had less of an impact early on in the in the pandemic. So small businesses, you know, stayed open more, had less of an revenue loss. And certainly there was kind of in, that impact, you know, just not being in kind of concentrated areas where COVID cases were increasing rapidly. In terms of mask mandates or some of the other policies, that's not as clear. It seems to kind of go both ways. There's a lot of disagreement in the literature, at least this early literature where we don't have, you know, kind of complete findings has found somewhat inconsistent results on it. Yeah, I think the, the one piece I would add to that kind of thinking about what to consider and, and data to be looking for in terms of some of the, you know, the, the shifting trends that we saw in COVID, uh, particularly around remote work and, and types of businesses that were starting um, to, to sort of accommodate that was really thinking about the importance of um, access to broadband and affordable broadband. And so thinking about what that looks like in you know, urban areas versus, versus rural areas is another area that there's a lot of research around kind of considering what that looked like uh, during COVID and what that would, might look like going forward. Great, thank you. Uh, a few more th uh, themes of questions I, that I think are, are kind of populating here. Uh, around jobs and uh, thinking about opportunity necessity. So the, even the, the way that's defined and, and getting into the sense of like uh, starting the business. And, and then uh, Rob, I think also you mentioned uh, as well and Jessica and you're concluding Mark's as well too about uh, the alternative work arrangements and how that may be affecting the job creation of these new and uh, young firms. Uh, and then also related questions on jobs with quality. You know, what are some of the uh, measures in an ideal world we would use to kind of measure these things, or what are some of the emerging uh, data sets or, or ways that we can measure quality now, as well as the impact of these work arrangements on how we might have traditionally measured just jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rob, do you want to start or do you want me to jump in? I was just going to say, why don't you start? That's such a difficult question. I mean, I've, I've been extremely frustrated trying to kind of nail down those types of issues. And we're pretty hard, you know, over the last five years trying to figure that out. So I will let Jessica answer this question. So maybe she has an answer. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know that I have uh, the answer, but I will share some thoughts. I think, you know, when we when we think about job quality and you know, what it really means to have a good job, there's you know there's a lot of different ways that researchers talk about it and and work to measure it. You know, at the simplest level, we talk a lot about wages and compensation. We can talk about benefits like healthcare and retirement. Um, we can talk about control over work. We can talk about control over hours. You know, flexibility, um, satisfaction with job. I mean, there's a lot of different dimensions on which you can think about what makes a good job. I think in terms of you know kind of what what does this mean and the data in terms of how do we measure these things? You know, when you look at um, the declining rates of business actualization, you know, and and, and what we're looking at is um, are businesses making a payroll, right? Are they paying a W-2 employee for these jobs? And we're seeing that happening less and less over time. It could be that more and more businesses are, uh, you know, hiring contractors, paying 1099 workers on, on more of a short-term kind of project basis. And that is just much harder to kind of capture in the, the data set that we're, we're using to look at, uh, to look at the new employer business. 
Um, and so I think there's a there's a certainly a lot of emerging data around sort of gig work around 1099s. We actually the the, the foundation had a, a really great um, uh, forum on gig work. <laughs> I'll put in a plug that that Derek moderated a couple of weeks ago. We'll, we can share the video with folks here. But just a lot of really rich discussion around these issues of, of measurement and trends and what we're seeing, and um, just trying to get. Um, kind of thinking through the definitions that we're using, how we're talking about things, and then what, how that shapes our understanding of the ways that, that these trends are changing. Yeah, it, it, it very complex. Yeah, there, uh, I was going to be super impressed if someone fixed that and, and resolved everything in the answer. So that was certainly not an expectation, but I think that certainly gives our audience a, a places to look to start to think about how to try to address some of these, these challenges. Uh, so another theme that's certainly emerging in the questions as well too, and I, th I think related initially to Rob's breakdown on uh, the uh, demographics by race and ethnicity, the emergence and increase in Latinx entrepreneurship over the 25 year time period for which we have the data. And I think just uh, some curiosity around uh, about what is uh, what what what's the story there? You know, what are some uh, places people can look to better understand that change? For instance, like how does that compare to like just general demographic population changes in the United States? Is it is it unique for entrepreneurship? Does it look a little different, or um, is there something about the other groups that are driving some of that composition change? I think it's really interesting. This you know, it's such a stark number, right? Going from 10% of all new entrepreneurs to 25% of all new entrepreneurs, such a major change over time. So if you look at that, what you see is that it's sort of two components, right? The biggest part of it is just this increasing share of the population. So just think of the increasing share of, of Latinx in the workforce overall, that, that's driving a lot of that growth. But then the second part is that the entrepreneurship rate per person has gone up also faster for Latinx than it has for, you know, for whites. And I think that that's another part of it that's driving it. Now, I think that that can be oversold is a great thing, that it could also be that a number of these businesses are necessity, they're smaller, they're done because of limited job opportunities or maybe for flexible work. And so it's not clear that these are gonna be the high growth potential types of businesses that we can see that really make a change in terms of economic inequality issues. That's not as clear, and I think that, that that's why I have a little bit of concern that we see this big increase in the rate of new entrepreneurs. But again, my measure, the measure that's created here is kind of a real general one. It's a very broad based one. It's including everyone, all types of businesses. These could be non-employers, they could be employer businesses, they could be unincorporated, incorporated. They could be individuals that have kind of more of a part-time business as long as they don't also have a wage and salary job that has more working hours. And so in that sense, just because we see a higher business creation rate doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting that kind of longer term success, that longer term economic success. But it does suggest that the, the things are changing and improving. Uh, another related question about uh, thinking through the ways that we can use this data and information. So one, certainly uh, to understand local areas and, and state activity and, and other macroeconomic activity. Uh, but also there, a question came in from the chat thinking about like business owners themselves, like is there a way for them to engage with this data or uh, is there a, um, a mechanism where it would make sense for them uh, to, to use this data as well too? Like, does it, could it help, for example, like with uh, connecting with politicians about advocacy and awareness about small business needs, or are there other uses that could be of, of value to small business owners? Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly being aware of trends uh, is valuable to all of us, right? Whether we're researchers, whether we are uh, policymakers, whether we are business owners, um, I think being aware of some, of some of these broader trends are just really helpful to provide some context around what each of us is experiencing and what each of us is seeing. I think in terms of, you know, business owners specifically and how these might be useful, um, I, I would actually 
uh, frame the question maybe a little bit different and, and thinking um, about some of our work here, really working to connect research with practice and research with policy. I would be curious to hear from, from business owners in terms of kind of what, what you are experiencing and how this might help inform additional research questions as we think about building out additional indicators. You know, I think um, Derek, you said it really nicely as we began the forum today that, that no one single indicator is going to tell us what entrepreneurship looks like across the U.S., right? We, we need a series of various ways of thinking about business starts and business ownership uh, and, in, you know, hiring employees, all of these various facets that we think about. And so, um, you know, and, and to ask really good research questions, we need to be grounded in the experiences uh, of individuals. And so I'm, you know, I, uh, I would I would be curious, kind of what would be of most use, of most interest to business owners in terms of what we're me what we're measuring, what we're able to measure, where we can uh, find that data, and then to provide that information back out. A uh, question that comes in uh, as well here too, and, and uh, Jessica, actually your answer kind of gets a little bit at this, which is for the audience, you know. What data is missing from this? And I, I think, you know, what else do we need to know and collect? And in a similar way, uh, how should the audience think about what these indicators can tell us and what they can't? And, uh, you know, Jessica, you certainly mentioned like the lived experience of actual entrepreneurs. That is an important complement uh, to any sort of data is, is to understand in the, the real world what's happening. And uh, so maybe uh, if either of you could speak a little bit about, uh, you know, what data is missing, what would be great to add or collect, or maybe even some potential plans for uh, things that would uh, hopefully will be added soon. Yeah. Well, I can start. Um, uh, and also, Rob would love to hear about <laughs> anything you might add to. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, and, and I spoke to this a little bit, um, earlier was particularly around uh, the new employer business indicators. Um, unlike Keith, we aren't able to look at demographic differences. So we aren't able to look at uh, differences by gender or differences by race in terms of what does actualization look like? What does velocity look like? Does it differ? Does it not? Um, and that's that's a real gap that I see that um, would uh, just be really beneficial in terms of helping us to understand how different people, different groups are uh, are experiencing these trends. Um, I think in terms of some of the the additional pieces, um, things that are needed, you know, I think pieces um, particularly around sort of this these questions around job creation, um, you know, thinking and and thinking about different types of work, uh, how uh, how new businesses might be generating sort of different types of work, perhaps not W-2 employees, but what does that look like? Um, what do those larger trends kind of look like? And then these questions about, about job quality as well. Um, and then I think to the, the kind of bringing some of these pieces together, I think the earlier points that were raised around granularity and really what you know, what things look like at a county level and an MSA level. I think those are also really important and things that we'll be digging into more in the future as well uh, in future indicators. Yeah, that, what I would kind of follow up on there is I think that we need a lot more information on, you know, racial inequality, gender inequality, you know, immigrant status, things like that are just really not that available in data sets. So the demographic information is there at the individual business owner level. But what we don't have is we don't have very much information about, you know, the sales of those businesses, the employment of those businesses, like how many employees they hire. And also, we don't know much about their exit rates or their survival rates. And those three kind of like business outcomes, those, those real basic general business outcomes are very difficult to find when you want to look at, say, minority owned businesses or businesses owned by people of color or by men and women differently. That's one of the most difficult things to find, and it just seems like a real void that we have in the federal government statistics that are produced. Now, the Census Bureau I know, as I work with several of them, is trying to kind of fill those gaps with a few different products. And so we're hoping that in the next few years, we'll have a lot more information. The information won't be as timely as what we're showing here in some of these um, indicator statistics but it will be there and it will be really useful for doing like very careful research on inequality issues. 
So as we near the end of our time, we have uh, more questions than we have time to address. Uh, there, so just to summarize a, a few, uh, there are some questions about uh, methodologies. Uh, encourage uh, those with questions to look at those links that have been dropped in the chat. Uh, th those will be some of the best places to look for some of those detailed questions about uh, the details behind uh, the indicators today. Uh, but then uh, another question we didn't have uh, get to yet uh, that might be good to kind of close up on here is thinking about the current labor shortage and how that affects both entrepreneurs in terms of these new businesses trying to hire, but also um, is that encouraging some of this entrepreneurial activity? Uh, some of this will, of course, be kind of uh, not, it's not in the data, but but so to speak, but what, but just your general thoughts about how the current labor market environment may be affecting some of the entrepreneurial activity and what we might see a year from now, once we have data for now, uh, what, what should we look for to kind of tell us about some of those connections? We seem, certainly hear a lot of small businesses complaining about the, the inability to hire workers. So I think that it is a limiting factor and I think that it will show up when we start to get the 2022 data. Yeah, I think, um... You know, I think there's there's just been a lot of shifts that have taken place over the past couple of years thinking about, you know, currently what's been going on in the labor market. I think, you know, even sort of previously, I think, um, you know, for, for my around a lot of my research interests are interests are around caregiving. And so I continue to kind of think about the impact that the past couple of years have had on caregivers and what that has meant for people's relationships to the labor market. Um, and so I, I think as Rob's Rob said, we're just going to have to wait, uh, wait and see, um, you know, for the next few months, few years to kind of see how all of this is going to shake out. Since we're nearing the end of our, our time together, I just wanted to thank Jessica and Rob again, both so much for their, their time today. Uh, really appreciate hearing so much about all of the uh, different indicators and, and what they mean and the connections. I think we've touched on so many parts to, uh, that this connects to. So everything from like work arrangements and caregiving. Uh, and, and then other issues that are certainly going on that we didn't get a chance to, but are certainly connected as well to thinking about like things like access to capital and, you know, who has opportunities and, and what choice looks like, depending on what kind of support structures are in place. So uh, again, uh, as, as mentioned at the beginning, like these indicators are only part of the story. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today to, you know, push that conversation along and, and for the ideas and questions. And, uh, you know, as we, as we wrap out, I just, uh, encourage everyone to uh, think about what would be helpful, you know, what are things that we're missing, you know, please feel free to reach out and, and let us know uh, what would be great, what would be helpful, and what can be next. Uh, so we have recorded this forum, uh, and we will share the video in the uh, future. Uh, a link to the previous recordings is also available. And our next event will be in July, where we'll host a forum on the COVID recovery for small businesses. And a link will be available uh, through our Insights to Entrepreneurship newsletter. We hope you can join us for our future events. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.